everyone. Welcome to today's online summit, Microsoft 365 Top Security Features and Best Practices. This event was organized by the hardworking folks at Redmond Magazine who have brought together some of the very best independent experts on today's topic. Many thanks to our three sponsors, Metallic, a Commvault Venture, Ignite, and Acronis. Without them, this would simply not be possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief in the Converge 360 Group of 1105 Media, and I'll be your moderator for the first of three information pack sessions. But before we get started, uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. A link to that recording will be coming your way soon. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. Type your questions in the Q&A box at any time. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Our sponsors have provided some extra resources that can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You definitely want to take a moment to check those out. And at the end of the summit, you'll be asked to take a very short survey. I know nobody likes this kind of stuff, but it really helps us. Uh, give us your honest opinions, good and bad, and you know you will have an impact on future summits. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving a Nintendo Switch. It's a home console. It's handheld. It's the only game controller you'll ever need, but you must be present to win, so stick with us. Now let's get started with our first session, Inside Microsoft 365's Security Features. For this, set, uh, for this session, we called on our old friend, Ben Stejink. Ben is an information technology pro with extensive experience with Microsoft platforms, including Microsoft 365, uh, SharePoint, and Azure. During his busy career, he has consulted with a wide range of organizations, from five-person shops to global enterprises, in fields ranging from government to professional sports. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and co-host of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro podcast, where he discusses the latest technologies in the Microsoft 365 and Azure, he tried to say, and Azure universes from an IT Pro point of view. You guys are in for a great session. Take it away, Ben. All right. Thanks, John. And I forgot, I need to have you update the bio. I can now add Microsoft MVP to my bio as well as of uh, Ooh, June. I'm going to add that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. I'm getting fancy. Um, but yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks for having me. We're kicking it off on a Friday a little bit uh, relaxed today. So always a pleasure to be back here uh, talking to everyone, hanging out with everyone. Um, so we're going to dive into it. Uh, if you do want to find me, frankly, just search for my name, uh, Ben Stedink. I've said it before. I still, as far as I know, am the only one out there. So searching for Ben Stedink, you'll find my website, company, LinkedIn, uh, all of that. So if you do have any questions, I know I try to get to a bunch of questions. I have, I think I have my LinkedIn bio, my email on the last slide. Um, Feel free to reach out if I don't get to your question at the end today. Uh, but let's dive into today's session, today's topic of inside Microsoft 365 security features. Uh, this is an interesting topic. Um, and I'm going to go over a little bit of background. Like, what does Microsoft actually do when we start talking Microsoft 365 security features, what's in there? Uh, one of the big things is what does Microsoft actually provide? Uh, this isn't just what features can you go enable, what features can you turn on, but what are some of the advantages of Microsoft 365 as a whole? Uh, and this actually comes from Microsoft's Digital Defense Report uh, for 2022. Uh, I think they come out towards the end of the year, so this was maybe October-ish of last year. Uh, depending on your interest level, this can be a very fascinating 95-page read, or it can be excellent to read if you can't fall asleep at night. Um, but I did pull some of the stats out of here, and when you start talking about Microsoft 365 and the security features, a big part of it is Microsoft's ability to get a more holistic view of what's going on in the security world. Um, what's going on across all of the tenants that they have in Microsoft 365? What are they even seeing across Azure? And being able to hone in on 
new security attacks, new breaches that are uh, up and coming. You can see on the slide, they actually analyze 43 trillion signals daily, uh, looking at different data analytics, AI algorithms, uh, everything that's hitting the Microsoft Cloud as a whole. A uh, few other numbers you can see, 37 billion email threats, 34 billion identity threats, uh, 8,500 engineers, data scientists, security experts, uh, all working to secure Microsoft 365. And they come out, and in this report, they go through some of the key impacts. You can see a list there of where our breach is happening. Uh, and really taking this report and leveraging, leveraging it when you start thinking about securing your own organization. Uh, one of the benefits Microsoft does have um, is that they're not only coming up with some of the security products that we'll look at today that are included in Microsoft 365, but because they're running these services, Exchange Online, Teams, SharePoint, uh, Windows, they're able to see where the attacks are coming into those particular services and immediately respond to that and uh, upgrade their environment, put in different protections, block IP addresses, block certain threats that they're seeing maybe come into a single tenant uh, and then block it across the entire Microsoft 365 and Azure ecosystem. Uh, so what are we talking about? I already saw this question uh, pop up in the questions, is what tier of Microsoft 365 subscriptions will be discussed? And this is actually a good slide to kind of talk about that today. We are going to be talking about Microsoft 365, not Office 365. Despite a lot of the mixed messaging, these are still two very different products. Uh, Office 365 at the enterprise level has your Office 365, E1, E3, E5. They are primarily collaboration tools. That is primarily going to get you Teams, Exchange, SharePoint, uh, different productivity tools. But then when it comes to something like security, you're going to be using security defaults instead of maybe conditional access. Uh, you'll get some things around data loss prevention. You get a few things in Defender for Office 365. But the security features that you do have when it comes to Office 365 um, are going to be more limited if you're in that Office 365 uh, vein of products. Uh, then you do have your Microsoft 365. This includes your Office 365 collaboration tools, but it also bundles in your enterprise mobility and security, your Windows 365. Uh, with this, you start getting things like Azure AD Premium. Uh, you get the Intune suite of products. Uh, you start getting more of the Defender things when it comes to Defender for Identity and Cloud App Security. Uh, so as we're talking today, we're going to look at Microsoft 365. We're going to be talking primarily from that lens and also primarily at an E5 level. Uh, I will try to call out differences, different things that you get at an E3 level versus an E5. When we get into these demos, when we start looking at what's here, uh, I do have E5 turned on, um, a lot of different security features. Uh, business premium is an interesting one. Uh, business premium popped up in the chat too. I'll try to mix that in. Um, I will also give you some good resources that we can go look at for understanding what's involved in these different uh, solutions. Business premium gets close to a Microsoft 365 E3 plan. Uh, it does get some things like Azure AD premium, conditional access, uh, some of those Microsoft 365 products, um, but there are some other areas where it does fall a little short of those E3 plans. Uh, so look at that. Someone brought up GCC. We are not going to talk about GCC. I don't have any clients that are GCC based. I don't spend a lot of time in the GCC space. And because of that, it's really hard for me to talk about what exactly is there and isn't there when it comes to GCC. Um, so that kind of sets the stage a little bit for what we're going to talk about. And 
right from there, let's jump into a demo and kind of look at how I approach comparing plans uh, when people start asking about it. So I'm going to share my screen. In this link, or the link on the last page, uh, points to this URL. And this is m365maps.com. Uh, it's put out by Aaron Dinage, I think is how you pronounce his name. It uh, does give you last updated. This was January of this year. Uh, and I believe he is a Microsoft employee, um, still a Microsoft employee. But when it comes to really starting to decipher what am I getting, what security features are included, or what do I have to upgrade to to get security features, this website is awesome. Um, big props to Aaron for keeping this up. You can see someone brought up business. You can go look at your business premium licenses. Uh, the big one I use a lot is this Microsoft 365 Enterprise and the Venn diagram. Uh, this does look small on the screen share. We can zoom in a little bit. But what this breaks down is it starts going into all of these different plans and what's included in each one of them. So we talked about the difference between Office 365. Down here in this red, you can see all of your Office 365 E3 features uh, that you would get. And then once you expand out to your Microsoft 365 E3, it starts adding in all of these other components. You start getting your Defender for Endpoint Plan 1 in a Microsoft 365 E3. If you scroll down, here's that Enterprise Mobility and Security E3. Uh, where you start getting things like administrative units, you start getting your Azure Rights Management Service, some of your endpoint analytics, Intune. Uh, all of those features that you get in Microsoft 365 E3, but also if you were going to go out and license some of these features independently, what you get with Enterprise Mobility and Security Plan 3. Or let's say you just wanted Azure AD Premium Plan 1. Here's that box of that subset of features that's in Azure AD uh, Plan 1. When it comes to those, you can scroll down here. Here's your Windows Enterprise E3 plan. Uh, this is also all included in that Microsoft 365, where you start getting Microsoft Defender for antivirus. You get your attack surface reduction. Uh, as you scroll out then, you'll see here's when it comes to Microsoft 365 E5. It essentially adds everything that's on this chart uh, when you start getting your Microsoft 365 E5. Here's all your individual E5 plans down the right side, what you get when it comes to a Defender standpoint, Enterprise Mobility and Security E5, uh, Windows Enterprise Premium. So as we're looking through features today, as we're talking through different things, uh, if you're looking for something specific, when it comes to how can I license this particular security feature? Is it Azure AD Premium Plan 2? Is it Azure AD Premium Plan 1? Is it one of those Defender plans? Is it in the Microsoft 365 E5 security plan? Uh, this chart gives you a lot of good benefits. Uh, we did mention Business Premium. Just like with the other ones, you can pop open Business Premium and start seeing some of those security features in here. You'll notice some of those overlaps. Azure AD Premium Plan 1 comes with business. You get a couple of these outliers that are in EMS, um, Intune, Information Protection, some Endpoint Analytics, some of your Windows Pro SKUs, and some of your Defender for Business. Uh, I often, even when I'm comparing like Business Premium to E3, Pull the business premium up next to the E3 to really start diving into what security features am I getting, what security features am I missing. Uh, there's lots of other things on this page. If you're curious about EMS, curious about some of the um, other plans out there, enterprise, frontline, breaking down some of the defender plans, uh, great resource. So jumping back to the slides, just for a moment. So we looked at how you can start figuring out what you have. Um, 
what are some of those primary areas of Microsoft 365 security that you want to think about and that we're going to dive into? And frankly, we're going to talk through this slide a little bit. And uh, it's a Friday. After this, we're just going to go into Microsoft 365 and start looking at some of these features, kind of what's there, how you can start setting them up, uh, where you may want to start thinking about them. As I do the demo, um, feel free to ask questions too. Again, I'll try to kind of keep one eye on the questions so that if there is a question specific to something I'm showing in the demo, uh, if possible, maybe we can address it right then. Uh, so identity and access management, this is a big one. Uh, how do I manage identities? How do I manage usernames, passwords? Um, how do I access who can get into my environment and what they can get into? The very first place to start with any Office 365 subscription or with any Microsoft 365 subscription, this is included at its core in both of them, is Azure AD. Uh, you also may start seeing Microsoft Entra. Uh, this is the new identity management portal. Azure AD is a subset of Entra. There's some other things in Entra. We're not going to get into those today. We'll primarily focus on Azure AD. But that is underneath every single Office 365 or Microsoft 365 subscription. Uh, it's gotten out there. People have started realizing this more and more. When Office 365 first came out, there were a lot of people that said, I have Office 365, had no idea about Azure AD, um, and that Azure AD was actually the underlying identity provider of Office 365. Uh, one of the other primary areas is information protection. Uh, if someone's logged into your environment, they've gotten into Azure AD, they've logged in, they have access to the information within Microsoft 365, uh, how are you protecting that data now that they have access to? Uh, how are you preventing them from exfiltrating data as an employee? Or how are you preventing them from just inadvertently sharing something or making sure that uh, data within your Microsoft 365 environment, SharePoint Teams, your Teams meetings, uh, all of that is protected. That's all going to be in your compliance center, information protection. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. Device management. Microsoft has made a ton of updates uh, to device management. There's a lot of features coming. Um, they actually just introduced some new Intune suite features. Uh, I think yesterday, two days ago, it was sometime this week uh, around Intune. This has gone through a few name changes. It started kind of as in tune for a year or so. We had endpoint management. It has been announced Microsoft is renaming the whole endpoint management back to Intune. Uh, there are some aspects of Intune things that have gotten pulled into Entra. That may have been a bullet point I missed on my slide, but device management, primarily going to be Microsoft Intune. Uh, whether this is Mac OS, uh, Linux, Android, iOS, Windows, it does vary platform to platform, but you have some level of control over all of those different devices within Microsoft Intune and making sure those devices are secure, the data on those devices are, is secure, um, all of that. And then finally, you have the security management portal. Um, this is security.microsoft.com or the Microsoft Security Center uh, is what it started as. That has been kind of rebranded the holistic security suite of Microsoft products is Microsoft Defender. Microsoft 365 Defender is a part of that. That's the former security center in Microsoft 365. This gives you a good overall view of your security. Uh, looking at things like the score of your secure, security, uh, assets that are connected to your environment. Um, gives you some reporting around endpoints. This is where a lot of email security has moved to. Email security started out being a lot of Exchange Online. Uh, a lot of this has been consolidated now into this Microsoft Defender portal. Uh, and then Cloud App Security. Again, this one used to be its own portal. If you've gone and played with Cloud App Security uh, lately, um, there is 
they will start redirecting you back to that security center um, and back to Microsoft 365 Defender. Uh, so with that, let's go take a look at some of these uh, that we've talked about. Uh, so let me get my screen share back up here. And while that's coming up, how do you get Microsoft 365? Uh, yeah, there is an E3 and E5. Um, if you are going out and looking, you have to be actually a little bit more intentional now about finding the Office 365 licenses. Uh, Microsoft will try to steer you towards Microsoft 365 most of the time. And you kind of have to dig a little bit to find Office 365. Uh, but that is it. There is two very distinct brandings and prices for Office 365 and Microsoft 365. Uh, so diving over into Microsoft Entra. Uh, Entra.microsoft.com is the new admin center for all things identity. Uh, I did mention there's a couple different things in here. Uh, you have Azure AD, you have some of your permission management. This takes you out to CloudNox, a product that Microsoft purchased. They're working on integrating it in. Um, that does have some of that security features across all of the clouds. This one, we're not gonna spend a lot of time there. You have verified IDs that are in here as well. But the big part that we're gonna look at is they pull in a bunch of the Azure AD functionality. Uh, if you've ever looked at Azure AD, um, not going through admin.microsoft.com, but going into your Azure portal and Azure AD, or another handy URL you can remember is actually AAD, Azure AD, .portal.azure.com. Uh, and this will take you right into Azure Active Directory. Uh, what they've essentially done with Entra here is taken a lot of those screens and really pulled Azure AD in uh, within a frame. So if we go look at something like deleted users, audit logs, um, any of those, you'll notice that that is very much, I already closed my Azure AD, here it is, Azure AD. Um, Azure Active Directory, users, deleted users, it is this screen just pulled into Microsoft Entra. It centralizes a lot of that functionality that's natively within Azure. Uh, you have your groups, you have your devices, applications. Those are all pretty standard for managing users, managing groups, viewing your devices, BitLocker keys. Um, there's not as much there, but then down here, you have protect and secure. Again, nothing new that's in here compared to what you have in Azure AD. It just gives you a little bit more of a uh, a centralized view of some of those features. So for instance, conditional access. This is one of my biggest security features. One of the things that I think everyone should go in and evaluate. This is an Azure AD P1 plan. It's included in premium, Microsoft 365 E3, Microsoft 365 E5, or you can just go out and buy Azure AD premium. Uh, this goes in and starts being able to set controls around what you can access within your Microsoft 365 and how you can access it. Uh, comparing it to Azure Active Directory, it's the same as going to Azure Active Directory, security, conditional access. Uh, again, Entry just makes it a little bit easier to get to it. Uh, what this allows you to do is start setting up policies around where am I coming from? Um, and which users is this applying to? So you can go in, say, these set of users, when they access a particular application, when they're trying to access Teams, or when they're trying to access SharePoint or Outlook on the web, um, or all of the cloud apps. And this doesn't just have to be all of the Office 365 cloud apps, but any applications that are connected to your Azure Active Directory tenants. Uh, so you can see in my environment, Atlassian or Confluence or Jira are connected to Azure AD. 
I use my Azure AD credentials to sign into all of my Atlassian products. That shows up in here that I can use conditional access for. Uh, Card Hop, Foxit PDF, uh, there's a bunch of different applications. Zapier, uh, I have that in there. So you can limit this to third-party applications or if you are looking for something just like SharePoint or Exchange Online. Uh, you can go in and search for those Microsoft applications, select which applications you want it to apply to. Uh, so when it comes to those applications then, what are those conditions that should be in place for people to ask, access them? Uh, if a user account is flagged with a certain risk level, should they be able to access Office 365? Uh, if they have a certain sign-in risk, if they're coming from a certain location, a certain IP address, um, if they're using certain client apps, the browser versus desktop applications versus some of those applications that use legacy authentication. Uh, and then what are you going to do? Based on all of those conditions around the apps, where they're coming from, who they are, do you want to block access or do you want to grant access, but then put certain constraints around that access where you're going to require multi-factor authentication or you want to make sure they're joining from a device that's joined to uh, Azure Active Directory. Um, <clears throat> lots of different features here. And then session controls, uh, sign-in frequency if you want to persist their session. Uh, be careful with conditional access. Very powerful to the point where it is possible to lock yourself out of your own tenant. Um, if you do things like all users, you'll notice Microsoft even throws up a warning. Don't lock yourself out. It's going to affect everybody. Uh, exclude a user so that if you put this policy in improperly, you can still get in and undo it. Uh, but very powerful feature within Office 365. Uh, another one that we can take a quick look at is, let's jump down to, there's, not, there's so many good things in here. Identity protection, this is where some of that risky user comes in, risk policies, sign-in risk policies. This is an E5 feature, Azure Active Directory uh, Premium Plan 2. Um, that's some of those risky features. Uh, identity governance. Privileged identity management is another one. This is another P2 feature. Uh, this one you don't necessarily need for all your users. If you want to just upgrade your admins to Azure Active Directory P2, uh, privileged identity management lets you go in and keep a user as a normal user unless they explicitly elevate themselves. You'll see for my account, I can elevate myself up to a global admin, uh, security administrator, attack simulation administrator. Now, if you go into active, you'll actually see right now, I am elevated to global admin, so I can get to all of these screens. It will end today at 3, 4, 20 p.m. Eastern time, at which time I will go back down to a normal user. Uh, this allows you to make sure that users are not always admins, that when they do have to elevate themselves to admin access, uh, that is, um, audited, it's logged of when they did that. So I can go in and see, um, I don't have any requests out there right now, my audit history. Uh, you can go in and see every single time my account went in and elevated itself to an admin role. I do it quite a bit because I'm in the admin center a lot, but there are days when I don't need admin access for anything. Um, so my account isn't elevated. I tend to do global admin a lot because I jump around, but this can be any role, user management roles, um, security administrator roles, compliance administrator roles. Uh, and recently, this is now also coming to desktop roles. Uh, I'm going to jump over to the Intune suite. One of the things that was announced this week with the Intune suite was endpoint privileged management. Uh, if you've been around Active Directory a long time, um, you may have done stuff with LAPS where you can essentially give admin access temporarily. This is kind of the Azure AD version of LAPS where you can now go in and set up 
endpoint privilege management so that when a user goes and runs an installer, uh, they actually get prompted to enter business justifications for it or log into it so that now you can have all of your users as standard users, give them the ability to maybe install an application, but audit that a lot more, put some additional controls around that versus maybe them having to call the help desk to get admin access. Um, this is a great feature. It's starting to roll out preview. I don't have it in my tenant yet. Uh, this is, should be there by April. I will caveat this with this is an additional license. Um, don't get me started on all the different add-ins that are coming into Microsoft 365. I was talking about this with somebody the other day. Uh, there is getting to be a lot of add-ins. It's hard to keep track. This isn't in the licensing page yet because of when it was launched. But this new Microsoft Intune suite is an additional uh, license. I did not get this in any of my slides, so I will post this in and maybe uh, someone can post that in the chat so that if you guys want to go look at this new Intune suite, uh, you can. Uh, so that's a quick overview. Keep an eye on time here because I want to get to a few other portals. Um, of some of what you can do in Entra, I did think I see a question here about Entra. Um, do you essentially get Entra? So you kind of get Entra with anything because Entra itself isn't really a product. Uh, Enter is more of a wrapper around Azure Active Directory. So even if you just have Office 365, you should still be able to access Entra. It's just going to be a limited feature set. You're not going to have things like the risky activities. You probably won't see conditional access in there. Um, you're just going to get a view into Azure Active Directory of what your specific license entitles you to with an Azure Active Directory. Uh, jumping over to the Security Center, uh, Microsoft 365 Defender. Um, again, lots of things you can do in here. If you haven't, go to security.microsoft.com. Go explore what you can do. One of the nice things here is just the Microsoft Secure Score. Uh, what is your score? What actions can you take to improve it? How do you rank against other organizations that are your size? Uh, so you can see my secure score, 50.69. Don't freak out when you go in here and it's really low. I don't know that I've ever seen a company be able to achieve 100% on their secure score. Uh, you can see when you look at a comparison, I'm doing like four points better than other organizations of a similar size. Uh, but it will go in and give you recommendations, turning on the firewall in Mac OS. And it walks you through not just what that recommendation is, but what exposed entities? This is the computer I'm on right now. Um, what do you have to do to go in and implement, implement this? Managing this in Microsoft 365 Defender. Uh, what's my score impact? Turning this on is going to bring me up 0.8%. Uh, so these are going to be ranked by score impact. Um, everything from Defender firewalls on a domain profile, private profiles in Windows, uh, impaired communications, Again, there's a lot of things in here, but it's a good place to go to see are there some quick wins or something that I am blatantly missing when it comes to securing Microsoft 365. What are these things that are going to make a big difference on my score? Because those are probably more of a bigger deal to go in and implement. Uh, we'll give you a history. How your score has changed over time. Mine's fluctuated some as machines are added, as different policies are maybe changed. Uh, some of that history, just a good health check of what does your security look like when it comes to Microsoft 365. Uh, Threat Analytics is another great dashboard to go look at. This is not just what threats are impacting me, but what threats are up and coming. Um, what are the latest threats that Microsoft is detecting? So here's one that is Dev0450, Dev0464, distributing the Quackbot for ransomware deployment. Um, you can see, for me, this is one that isn't going to have, it's not active anywhere. I don't have any 
alerts related to this specific threat in my organization. I don't have any devices that are currently impacted, but it still gives me a good overview of actually what is this threat. So if you're in that security space and you want to go see what are these threats, um, what are some of the reports on here, it has a whole um, report, what the mitigations are for these threats, uh, related incidents. So this is going to now go down more specifically to my environment is am I facing this particular ransomware? Are there other related incidents within my Microsoft 365 tenant um, related to this? What are those assets that are impacted? Again, we already saw I don't have any in my environment that are impacted by this. Um, any exposures? I have a relatively low exposure level there. Again, no impacted devices. And then also, what are some of those recommendations? So this actually goes back then to that secure score. And what are these things that I should do in order to better protect myself against this particular um, ransomware deployment? Uh, it's going to raise my secure score, going to leave me in a much better state when it comes to protection. Uh, trials, this is where some of that Intune stuff is going to start showing up. It is, no, this is not it. Sorry, think of something else. Um, different trials around security in your environment, uh, devices. Devices that are joined to Azure Active Directory, devices that, uh, again, my Mac, it's not necessarily domain joined, but I do have the uh, Intune portal on here. So it's able to pull in information. I've been onboarded into Microsoft Defender. Um, up in my taskbar, you'd see Microsoft Defender running. and being able to see what are these devices that maybe have a higher risk level. These four are fine. My MacBook that I'm on now has a little bit higher risk level. And it allows me to go into these devices and look at what is causing this risk level uh, within my device. Uh, what are those actions that I should take? Um, this apparently does not want to load today. Uh, but if it did, you would be able to see a lot more information about that device. Identity is going to give you a lot of the same stuff, only focused more on your users, your identities in Azure Active Directory, rather than those physical devices. Uh, do, do, do email. I mentioned they're pulling a lot of the Exchange stuff out of the Exchange Admin Center into Microsoft Defender. This is where a lot of your email and collaboration is going to go. Uh, around some of those threats. Policies and rules. This is one that's kind of buried in here. Um, sometimes I go into configure stuff and I forget that there's this kind of some menu of policies and rules. Uh, if you want to go in and set up certain alerts, so when certain activities happen within your environment and you are curious around uh, what's happening. These alert policies are great. I have a couple of them set up. Um, apparently nothing wants to load. But things like a new SharePoint site is created. There we go. I have one around a new site collection created in my SharePoint environment. Or getting an alert when files are shared. Uh, this one I have set a little bit higher. Uh, credit card or financial information. When this is around um, matching a sensitivity label, matching certain content, it's going to flag, uh, flag an alert, send me an email, put an alert in my security center that someone tried to send an email that contains credit card information or social security numbers, tax IDs, bank account information. Um, so being able to it's a little bit more reactive in that it has to happen before you get the alert, but you get that alert right away and you're able to respond to it. Um, so it allows you to go in and customize all of those different settings around the severity, what this category is in, what are those different alerts. So this is going to be all those different activities that you can choose from around files, around emails, around changes in Azure Active Directory and user permissions, um, synchronization, lots of options here and really helping you to 
respond to any of those even potential vulnerabilities. Maybe a shared file is potential. You're working in a classified environment. Anytime some file gets shared, you really need to go check it out right away. Uh, within that policies and rules subset, um, threat policies are going to be um, similar to, this is where a lot of your uh, anti-spam, anti-phishing, safe links, safe attachments, uh, different block lists for your tenant, domain blocks, IP blocks for emails. Uh, there's lots of settings within this policies and rules that you really should go look at. Again, I always forget that it's like this submenu to get to all of these different settings. Um, lots of stuff you can do there. Attack simulation training. Uh, just real quick, this is another feature that's built in. I can't remember what the license level for this is. Uh, but if you do want to even um, include some attack simulations within your environment, all built right within Microsoft 365 Defender, you can go build out uh, simulations to uh, go see how do your users respond if there's a malware attachment or a link in an attachment, uh, OAuth consent grant. Um, some people will go out, there's third parties that do some of these testing as well. Uh, but if you have some of these Microsoft 365 licenses, go in and take advantage of the simulation to test those users. Uh, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Web content filtering is another one. Um, it's a little bit hidden, but if you go into settings, and this is another one of those menu within a menu within a menu, uh, you can actually even do web content filtering with Microsoft 365. So down in these settings in Defender, and endpoints, and once these have all been onboarded into Defender, you have web content filtering, where you can go in and set certain policies in place where you can start blocking particular adult content, high bandwidth content, um, I don't want to block that one, legal liability, uh, there are some uncategorized ones, and going in and picking which devices are these blocked on, how is it going to be blocked. If you have one like this where you don't have any blocked categories, it does some auditing of your web traffic, and you can go pull that up in different reports and watch some of that web traffic. There are different conditions. This one does function a little bit differently across OSs. We will say it works way better on Windows than it does on Mac OS. Um, but it is in there, something you can use within indicators. You can go in and set custom IP addresses, URLs, and domains to block as well. So that if you do have some of those uh, websites that inadvertently get blocked, um, or if you need to go in and block specific ones, you have some of that functionality as well. Uh, within that endpoint management within Microsoft 365. Uh, jumping over to keeping an eye on time here. Um, oh, security baselines. I think I saw somebody asking about some guidelines. Microsoft does offer some security baselines as well for some of these policies that you can set. Um, we're not going to have time to get into it. Uh, I also saw a question about best practice around break glass accounts. I haven't seen anything specifically from Microsoft around best practices on creating them or exclusion into conditional access. I have my own best practices. Mine are the username I use a random password generator for. It's 16 random characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers uh, for the username. The password, I don't know, I think it's like a 32 character random password for my break glass accounts. People are gonna guess usernames like admin, administrator, whatever, um, especially if they know your domain. So. I like all of my break glass accounts and administrator accounts completely random when it comes to both the username and the password. Uh, Purview is a compliance center. Uh, this is something else to think about. Some people think compliance, they don't think about security. The biggest one here is data loss prevention um, and information protection when it comes to security. Data loss prevention allows you to do email, 
SharePoint, uh, Teams, and protecting sensitive information, it also includes DLP settings. So you can actually use sensitivity labels and data loss prevention to do things like preventing uh, sensitive information from being saved out or transmitted out over Bluetooth or being copied to removable USB drives or being sent to a printer or a network share group. Uh, endpoint DLP settings are great. This one I know is a higher level too. I think this is also an E5 license. Um, but then information protection is another one and being able to do labels for certain content. Uh, confidential information that's stored within your environment. You want to go in and set policies around it, uh, including meetings now. Um, I have tried a demo of this. There's something goofy going on in my licensing, but you can now do labels to protect meetings and chats. So you can automatically watermark meeting recordings and teams if that has a certain label on the meeting. Um, you can go in and set up groups and sites and content, all groups and sites around um, those sensitivity labels. So if this was applied to a particular team, um, being able to limit the ability for users to share content in a team or in a SharePoint site with external users based on that sensitivity label that's applied to that particular team, to that particular SharePoint site, um, setting up conditional access, some of the external sharing there uh, when it comes to protecting information within those sites or within teams. Uh, another one I highly recommend going and looking at these labels. Um, they're starting to show up everywhere, even in your documents now. Up at the top in the title bar, uh, at least on Mac, somewhere similar in Windows, you can go instantly classify your document with a certain label, you can classify email with it to put some of that additional protection around it. Uh, and then finally, and then I'll try to get to a few questions here. We'll spend a couple minutes on Intune uh, endpoint protection. Uh, within your Intune Center, this is where you can go in and secure different applications. Uh, application protection policies is one of my favorite things when it comes to Intune and being able to carve out a section of your device for corporate data and keep it segmented from the rest of the information on your device. A lot of people, BYOD scenarios where they want to go in and say, all right, we'll let them go in and connect to our environment in a BYOD scenario. But when they go connect to our corporate data, they're going to have to use the Microsoft apps. They have to use Microsoft Outlook to connect to email. And once they connect to email, we're maybe going to allow or block them from backing up our corporate email in Outlook on their personal device to things like iCloud or Google backups. Or we're going to go in and prevent copying. So they can copy data into Outlook, but they can go into an email, select the body of the email, copy it, and paste it into a text message because we're using these Intune app protections to segment corporate data from personal data without having to enroll the device and get management over the device as a whole. Uh, so Intune app protection is great for protecting that corporate data in those uh, BYOD type scenarios. Uh, this is also where you start having the endpoint security. You can manage antivirus disk encryption on all your mobile devices or all your devices firewalls, when that privileged endpoint, privileged identity for endpoints comes in, that's going to come into this endpoint security as well. There will be an additional option here to secure endpoints. Um, security baselines, templates where if you want certain policies applied around Defender for Endpoint, Edge baselines, Windows 365 baselines, these are Microsoft templates of how should we go in and, I don't have my profile in here, but create a profile for this device around how we want to go in and secure it. Device guard, event logs, file explorer, firewalls, Internet Explorer, if that needs to go away and become Edge. Um, here's Edge down here. 
uh, really going in and getting control over these devices. And then once they're enrolled, you're applying policies to them. You have all of your typical device management in here where you could go into a device and do things like uh, lock it, do a remote wipe on it. Um, this is a cloud PC, reprovision it, restart it. Uh, all of those security actions around those devices. So that is a bit of a whirlwind tour of security. I want to leave a few minutes for some questions here. So, um, John, are there just, any uh, questions out there? There are. They've been rolling in. If uh, uh, Just a little reminder, everybody, that they can type their questions into the Q&A box uh, at any time. All right, let's see what we've got here. Um, Eric is asking, uh, so WRT Intune and Endpoint Protection, is there anything on the roadmap to extend this into complete EDR solution, in particular automated uh, incident response and monitoring with the, uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework? So you can do some of it. I should have showed that, uh, Eric. There is a incident response in Microsoft Defender that does tie into doing it on end user devices as well. Um, so if you go to security.microsoft.com and you go into incident response, uh, there are some things there. You can also start integrating this. So everything I just showed, you can also pull into Azure Sentinel, which is uh, Microsoft's cloud-based uh, XDR, EDR, SIM solution and you can do some of that automated incident response monitoring um, around the MITRE ATT&CK framework within Sentinel. Uh, it gives you some additional uh, ability above and beyond the um, incident response and the incident management right within Microsoft Defender itself. Fascinating. So Dylan has kind of an interesting question. He's wondering if he, if I wanted to make a 10-year indelible email archive for all users and all email, would I be able to do that with a mix of uh, ME3 and ME5 licenses? You can actually do that, I think, with E3. Um, it's a little bit of a workaround, but if you do 10-year retention policies, uh, you have – uh, retention policies that you can put in place on email and essentially say retain all email and all my user email boxes for 10 years. Um, if that user leaves, if the mailbox is deleted, that retention policy will ensure that that email stays around. Flip side is it's a little bit harder to get to it. You don't have a mailbox that you can necessarily go find or browse through or any of that. Um, but using PowerShell, the e-discovery searches, all of that, for most of the time, this is for legal cases, you could then go into e-discovery and do a content search, and it would search against all of those e mailboxes uh, that have been put on, that have had that retention policy applied to them. Gotcha. So a lot of questions have been rolling in about uh, purview. Um, I'm not sure. Um, let me just try, let me just grab one here. Um, well, here's a short one. Um, I saw what license is, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what license is required, uh, this is Steve asking, what license is required for these, uh, quote, uh, purview slash DLP, end quote, features? DLP, you get with Office 365. You're not going to get mm -hmm. everything, but you can actually do uh, sensitivity labels and some of the DLP stuff, not even with a Microsoft 365 E3, but it's with Office 365 E3. And if you go into that uh, licensing map I showed earlier, you can find DLP in there as its own item. Um, but yeah, Office 365 E3, without the Microsoft version of it, will do data loss prevention. Uh, there's some mm -hmm. automatic labeling, uh, that type of stuff that starts getting into more of the E5 plans, but basic DLP, Office 365 E3. Fascinating. Okay, we've got one here from, oop, it slipped away. Um, from Sandra, she's wondering, do you have any recommendations regarding admin consent requests? We never know whether it's safe to accept them. 
so I'm going to assume, Sandra, it's like going in for the privileged identity manage. Mm -hmm. Let me think. Admin consents. Oh, or, there's a couple things here. Admin consents. Okay. And maybe this is third-party applications. Um, if you trust the company or not, uh, those are a little bit tricky for admin consent, mm -hmm. for do you want to let this application have access to these individual pieces of information? Uh, it's really, you got to go look at like the company itself and how much you trust them mm -hmm. and do you need it? That's a tough one, Sandra, to say, accept it in these cases, not in these. I have mm -hmm. seen apps that I feel like are asking for way too much where you go in and like the list is 10 items long and it's like, okay, this is to manage my email. Why is it asking for SharePoint permissions? Um, that would raise a red flag for me. So look through the list, evaluate what is this product supposed to do? What is it asking for? And does it really need that? Uh, is it a reputable company um, as well? Uh, yeah. Oh, um, okay, cool. All right, so here's one from Vic who's wondering, if we just use Microsoft 365 and aren't really logging slash monitoring any other systems, is there a benefit to an uh, SIEM like uh, Microsoft Sentinel or Splunk? Um, I, would say, I would say so. You want to pull them in. Um, one of the reasons certain audit law, this would be the biggest reason in my mind, if you're not actively monitoring it, audit logs in Microsoft 365 native don't always stay along forever. A lot of them are 30 days. Uh, some of them are 90 days. There's a couple of cases where you get up to a year if you have an E5 plan. The advantage of pulling them into Sentinel or Splunk is the retention is whatever you set. You're not, uh, you're not boxed into what Microsoft says the retention will be for a particular log. So Azure AD, 30 days, I think Azure AD sign in logs are 30 days, six months from now where you mm -hmm. want to go and evaluate because there was some incident. When you hear about companies with multi-year incidents and they want to go back mm -hmm. even two, three years, uh, mm -hmm. that's when having something in Splunk or Sentinel would be beneficial um, from that perspective. Okay, we got time for one more question. I want to get this one in from Gina. She's asked, uh, she says, we have a need to be able to open encrypted email messages in e-discovery uh, searches. We have a G5, uh, we have G5 licenses. Should we be able to do that? Should we be able to open encrypted email messages in e-discovery searches? Income, e uh, incoming or outgoing? is going to be oh. <laughs> a question there. <laughs> Incoming, mm -hmm. I would say, are going to be hard, especially depending on where they originated. A lot of times, encrypted email messages, when they're incoming, they're not actually in your inbox. That's where you get this link. Go sign in to view the message, and it takes you out to a website because it's not actually leaving. It's staying encrypted, and you're kind of going out to see wherever it is. The contents of it aren't necessarily in the mailbox. So incoming probably mm -hmm. not going to show up in e-discovery. Outgoing mm -hmm. should be able to. Those are on your mail server. They're only being encrypted when they get sent out to somebody. But they, I mean, they're still encrypted in your platform. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're kind of embedded in there. You should be able to get to those outgoing ones. Okay, I have gone over my time. The next speaker and moderator are going to kill me. But uh, I want to thank uh, Ben for a great, uh, great session. Uh, we are going to take a short break, and we'll be back at the top of the hour, maybe a little after, uh, for our second session, Best Practices for Keeping Microsoft 365 Secure, led by Nathan O'Brien a Microsoft Certified Solutions Master in Messaging and a former Microsoft MVP for Office Servers and Services. This session will be moderated by uh, my, my old pal, Chris Bowley, the intrepid editor of Redmond Magazine. Many thanks to Ben Stedjink for a great session and to our three sponsors, Metallic, a Commvault Venture, Ignite, and Acronis. Thanks, too, to Victoria Waba, the woman behind the curtain, 
who uh, backs us up and keeps us on track. And remember, during our third session, we will be giving away a Nintendo Switch to one lucky attendee, but you must be present to win. So stay tuned. Back in a few. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our speakers, my fellow moderators, and of course, our sponsors, Metallic, a Comfort Venture, Ignite, and Acronis for underwriting the summit and allowing us to bring you this great content. My name is Chris Paoli, editor, and I am here to moderate the second session of our Microsoft 365 Top Security Features and Best Practices Summit, called Best Practices for Keeping Microsoft 365 Secure. Our speaker for this session is Nathan O'Brien, consultant and Microsoft Certified Solutions Master. Nathan is a Microsoft Certified Solutions Master in messaging and a five-time former Microsoft MVP for Office Servers and Services from Portland, Oregon. Take it away, Nathan. All right, thank you very much, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Glad you could all join us here today. Today I'm going to talk about keeping Office 365 secure. <clears throat> Um, so this session, I've kind of set it up um, kind of with the idea that, you know, I do this, I'm a consultant, I do this fairly often, I talk to customers about how they can secure Office 365. I've kind of set this session up in the way that I do kind of introductory, high-level um, sort of conversations with, with customers when, when they ask me, how do I keep Office 365 secure? tried to bring forward a number of the things that I think are fairly important that uh, organizations should look at when they're trying to keep Office 365 secure. And I tried to do this in kind of a fairly quick hit sort of uh, way. So a lot of these are, are fairly quick. Um, hopefully there's at least a couple things in here that, uh, that we talk about that everybody can use and, and you find useful. Certainly welcome to any questions. If anyone has any questions at any point during the conversation, please feel free to put them into the chat, and uh, we will address those towards the end of the webcast. I'll, of course, read those off, and we'll check into them. Before you ask questions, I do want to say, I kind of looked at the last session. There were a number of licensing questions. While I will do my best to address any sort of questions that come up, I will say that Licensing questions tend not to get great answers. I, I'm not really a licensing guy, and you know, being a licensing expert in Office 365 is a huge amount of work. Not really what I keep up with, so I'll try to answer those questions as they come up, but know that for the most part, licensing questions, my answer is gonna be I'm not entirely sure and everything changes so quick. Not, not sure. Okay. So with that, let's get started and talk about uh, securing Office 365. Again, everybody wants your Office 365 uh, tend to be secure. There's a lot of different licensing levels and features um, that are available within Office 365, Microsoft 365. I'm going to try and cover some of, um, you know, introductory kind of things that I think are important for organizations to look at and know what to secure. Again, I'm not really talking about licensing here. If you have licensing questions, feel free to ask, but know that the answer may very well be I have no idea. Let's get right into it. So the first thing I always talk about with customers when they, when they address Office 365 security is multi-factor authentication. I think at this point it should be um, pretty basic. I think everybody should have multi-factor authentication turned on for every single account in Office 365 or in other systems probably uh, as well, wherever possible. Every account in Office 365 does have the ability to have multi-factor authentication turned on regardless of the licensing level. However, um, at some of the lower licensing levels, the only way to get multi-factor authentication is through security defaults. Up there in Azure AD properties, manage security defaults. You can go in and manage security defaults and you can turn on security defaults from there. Again, multi-factor authentication works for all accounts in Office 365, but some of the lower licensing levels, it only works through security defaults. I think you need, I'm not entirely sure what the licensing level is to, to use MFA without it, but there can be some 
licensing considerations there. Uh, also, with multi-factor authentication, I always find it important to say that not all multi-factor authentication is the same. Um, using multi-factor authentication through an authenticator app is much better, much more secure, and there are more features available, certainly in the Microsoft Authenticator app, than there are in other places. You still can use SMS, text messages, or phone calls as multi-factor authentication, just those are much less secure. That, um, that path isn't, uh, that, that um, kind of communication path over the telephone network isn't encrypted the same, isn't encrypted, um, so that you know, using text messages and phone phone calls as multi-factor authentication is not as secure, and I don't recommend that. Uh, conditional access policies, which require Azure Active Directory P1, um, can make MFA much easier for the users. If you use conditional access policies, you can then control how MFA behaves so that users don't have to do MFA every time they log in. Uh, if, you, if they're logging in from, say, the office, uh, you can have them skip MFA entirely if that's what you want to do. So consider conditional access policies with that to make the user experience uh, more friendly. Next thing I like to recommend, uh, real quick and easy kind of security thing that, that organizations can do, um, is I always recommend creating at least one kind of break glass admin account in your Office 365 tenant. Uh, this is in case things go wrong, if you, if you mess up accounts, if you have a DirSync problem, if you, know, you do something with conditional access or MFA that blocks you from getting into your account and controlling your tenant, it's always a good idea to have a break glass, a, a specific global admin account that's set aside, nobody uses, but is there in the event of emergencies. Always recommend that. Create a cloud-only global admin account with a very complex, long password that's only used for emergencies. Again, recommend excluding MFA, conditional access, all those things from that specific account because the only time you're going to use that account is if you know, something goes wrong probably with one of those systems and you can't get in. Always recommend uh, that password is stored in a secure location. Um, I, I, was, I used to be in the military. I was in the Marine Corps, had top secret security clearance. One of the things that we do uh, for kind of that highly sensitive information uh, is we would, we would secure it with uh, TPI, what, uh, what they call two-person integrity. So if we had something like that, a, a important piece of information, we'd keep that locked in a safe that would have two separate locks on it with two different people having access to those locks. So you know that it takes two people to get access to that specific account. That's something that I've recommended for customers um, with these break glass accounts when they are you know, concerned about that security. You can use that extra measure to secure those accounts. Moving on here, RBAC roles for admins. Of course, always recommend, not gonna spend a whole bunch of time on this, um, but always recommend limiting down your admins to just the permissions they need. When Office 365 first came out, there were very limited kind of RBAC roles available. Um, global admin or Exchange admin or SharePoint admin were there. But now there are lots, uh, certainly scores, maybe over 100 different admin roles that are pre-set up for you within Azure Active Directory that you can use uh, to kind of limit those, those permissions that specific administrators have and while still allowing them to do the tasks that they need to do. Highly recommend using those pre-configured roles um, if you can. Sometimes organizations need more specific RBAC roles and you can absolutely create your own, but that's a lot of work. I'm not really gonna go into that here. It is possible to create custom RBAC roles. Um, kind of a lot of work, don't necessarily recommend that much unless you have someone who's very versed in how that all works and ready to maintain it. Um, I, I have been asked several times as a consultant to set those things up. Happy to do that, and, but I always give the, the 
kind of warning that it's a complex setup and maintaining it long term is kind of the issue there. If, if someone like me sets those up, you want to make sure that you have someone who understands how they work and who can maintain them or change them going forward. Okay, next thing I wanted to talk about here is enabling the unified audit log. So auditing in Microsoft 365, uh, there is auditing that's turned on by default across the entire platform. I think it's important for organizations to look at the auditing that is set up by default, understand what auditing is there, what events are audited, how they're audited, how long those things are kept. Um, keep keep a good understanding of that and then adjust the auditing within your tenant so that you, you're you getting the information that you need, you know how long that information is stored. Uh, kind of at the end of the previous session, I heard him talking about uh, kind of different amounts of time that different audit logs are kept. Uh, please be aware of that sort of thing. Uh, as you're going through your auditing, make sure you know, you know, this type of information is kept for this amount of time. So if you do have an incident in the future, you know what logs you have available and you can evaluate the necessity for kind of a third party sort of add on there if you need logs uh, to be kept for longer than the default time. Again, as I said in the last session, Different audit logs, our information is kept for different amounts of time, and it's really hard to, you know, have all that information kind of at the tip of your fingers to know how long different stuff is kept for. So please go through that. You can turn on the unified audit log that writes more information into the individual user's exchange mailbox um, and also allows logs to be collected in the Office three, or the M365 Compliance Center. You can turn on audit logs to control that there. Once you enable audit log, that unified audit logging, then that allows you to turn enable alert policies. Alert policies are policies within Azure Active Directory that can alert you when specific types of events occur. Um, there are default policies that can be present for you in your tenant depending on licensing level. Uh, certainly, if you have that E5, Microsoft 365 E5 license, uh, and have all the Defender suite of applications, there are a bunch of good default alert policies that are in there. But you can also create your own alert policies. Um, and if you don't have that Defender, there is some you can do to create alert policies for yourself. Keep you aware of specific types of events if there's something that, that you want to be notified of if it happens, if non-owner access of a mail, mailbox occurs, or if somebody accesses CEO's mailbox maybe specifically, or certain types of events, administrators change permissions, that sort of thing. There may be things that you want to be alerted to. Alert policies can uh, help you keep that aware, uh, keep aware of those sort of changes in your environment as necessary. Again, uh, as I'm going through here, I want to remind everybody, please feel free to put your questions into the uh, into the question queue there, and we will address them at the end of the session. All right, moving on. Continual access elevation, or evaluation, sorry. Um, so when you log into Office 365, uh, various different apps and web portals and everything, uh, you're, you're granted kind of an access token, and that access token is good for a set amount of time. By default, um, without CAE turned on, I believe it's about an hour. So permissions changes uh, to your account uh, within that time that you have that token don't immediately take effect. This is you know, kind of the, the old thing that we're all used to with, with Windows systems. Uh, when you make permissions change on a computer, you kind of have to reboot that computer before those permission changes take effect. This is sort of the same thing. Continual access elevation uh, examines the individual user's rights more often and then can be used to say if you want to, you know, disable a user account and make sure that that user is actually kicked out uh, more quickly, uh, continual access elevation can do that for you. I uh, believe it needs Azure Premium P1 to use CAE. 
is a great tool uh, for improving your security in your tenant. Um, it is it is possible to kind of modify the settings of those authentication tokens outside of CAE. I strongly recommend against doing that though. It's a very complicated process and I've seen a bunch of customers kind of mess up their, their tenants uh, doing that. Super recommend use CAE if you want to kind of limit the time that users are logged in without, you know, after their account is revoked, don't try to do that manually. It can get kind of dangerous uh, making those changes manually. Next thing I wanted to talk about is the Azure Portal Inactivity Timeout. See here, there is a setting that you can force users to log out of the Azure or log users out of the Azure Portal uh, after a specific amount of time. You can control that within the portal. It's always a good idea to review those settings and ensure that they are set. Uh, something that makes your organization comfortable. So administrators are in the Azure Portal, walk away from their computer, or whatever little handy extra bit of security that you can force log out those sessions with a specific time limit. Here you can see I have it set to 15 minutes on my tenant. Moving through the list here, next thing I, I uh, suggest is enable the preset security policies in Exchange Online. So if you go to security.microsoft.com, go down to the messaging section, there are preset security policies in there. Uh, alert policies, access policies, let's see, what are they? They are threat policies, alert policies, and I believe activity policies are in there by default. Three different categories of policies, and there are additional policies under each of those. Uh, they're already pre-built for you. You can use those policies to, again, Notify your administrators of specific activities that take place within your tenant. Always great idea to go through, review those, ensure that those are set the way that makes your organization comfortable and your administrators are aware of some of these security events happening within your tenant. Always a great idea to go through and re review those. The preset templates uh, in there are updated by Microsoft. So if you set one of them today, Microsoft may make changes to that policy uh, for you by default, and then you would get different information from that. So I always recommend, you know, know what's in there, but if you're using those default policies, uh, review them every once in a while because they may change on you. Whereas if you create your own policy, uh, that's going to be static. Microsoft isn't going to reach in and change ones that you can create. They will change the default ones in there. Okay, moving forward. Next thing I like to suggest uh, for organizations, and I see this a lot, everybody wants to um, tag the emails that come, ex come into your tenant from external as external. Many organizations uh, have gone through kind of a lot of work to build, um, to build transport rules to do that tagging in Office 365. That's great, but there is a simple single PowerShell command that you can use to turn on those external tags in your tenant. Put that up there on the screen, set external in Outlook dash enabled true, run that, that will turn on that external tagging for everyone in your tenant, the way that I did it there, uh, with you know just a couple seconds of work. Uh, very easy to do, you don't have to go through uh, and creating your own transport rules to, to to insert little banners and everything in the messages. This will set that all up for you nearly instantly, very easy to do. Uh, all right, 25 minutes after the hour, trying to keep track of the time here so we don't run out of time and leave a little bit of room at the end for questions. Also, I like to recommend that users review the sign-in logs in their tenant. <clears throat> So you can go into Azure Active Directory and you will see a bunch of sign-in logs in there. All the authentication for users is kept in there by default for, I believe it's 30 days. Always recommend administrators go through and review those sign-in logs. Furthermore, you can use the filters there as I showed up, <clears throat> as I put in that screenshot. You can use the filters there to filter to specific types of sign-ins. Uh, things like sign-ins from specific addresses, 
specific resources or with a, a specific authentication protocols. I like to use this to check for kind of legacy authentication sign-ins into the tenant, make sure that everybody's using good secure authentication protocols, make sure you understand what sorts of devices are connecting to your tenant, where users are connecting from. All this can be very helpful information in responding to kind of security incidents. Uh, so reviewing those sign-in logs can be very important uh, in, in kind of identifying and preventing security breaches. Sign-in logs, great tool. Please be familiar with that. Use it as you can. All right. Next thing we have on the list here, disable POP and IMAP authentication into Exchange Online. Um, so Microsoft has been removing all the legacy authentication into Office 365. You'll notice uh, by and large, there's not a whole lot of legacy authentication that you still can do into Office 365. It's been turned off uh, for a lot of stuff, but POP and IMAP are still available for your Exchange Milebox. Obviously those use legacy, very simple authentication. We wanna prevent that. This simple PowerShell up there on the screen, you can disable IMAP and POP for all your mailboxes within your tenant. Not very often used IMAP or POP anymore, so should be pretty safe to disable that for everybody in your organization. And you can go back to the security logs um, and see if anybody's signing in with IMAP or POP uh, to your tenant so that you don't, you know, break people turning this, turning this off. But by and large, not very many people use it. Um, should be disabled for all accounts where possible, in my opinion. Pretty simple PowerShell there to make sure that that's disabled. All right. Next thing I'd like to talk about is SharePoint legacy authentication. Again, Microsoft's been doing a great job removing those legacy authentication protocols, um, but you will still see within SharePoint, it is possible for applications to be connected to your SharePoint site that don't use modern authentication. This is a simple setting you can use to go and block that so that any applications you add into your SharePoint site are not allowed to authenticate in with legacy authentication apps always have to use modern authentication, always recommend that. Simple control, just a couple minutes here. Anybody can go into the SharePoint Authentication Center, as you see, or the SharePoint Admin Center, as you see there. Point it out real quickly how to go in, block any applications from using the legacy authentication. Okay, next thing we have here, block shared mailbox sign-in. By default, um, when you create shared mailboxes, resource mailboxes, uh, equipment mailboxes, that sort of thing, room mailboxes, um, all those mailbox types, they don't require a license. Nobody really should be logging into them. You should be logging in with your primary account and then accessing those different mailbox types uh, through that. However, these accounts still can log in uh, by default uh, authentication is not blocked for them. So I put up a quick PowerShell in here. This will reach it, look through all your mailboxes in Office 365 and will disable authentication for shared mailboxes, equipment mailboxes, and room mailboxes. Blocks those from logging in directly. Still, you can use them. You log into your account and access the shared mailbox, assuming you have permissions to it, but this prevents direct authentication into those accounts. Something I always recommend. All right, next thing we have here, block auto forward to external domains. So again, um, a, a many organizations, you know, will wanna turn this off, will not allow users to just set up an auto forward rule on their mailbox that will forward all their mail out of their mailbox into an external domain. Users tend to use that, you know, to, to keep separate copies of all their mailboxes, their own Gmail account or that sort of thing. Here's a, a quick way. Uh, you can create a transport rule there to go ahead and block all those, all, those, all those users from turning on 
the automatic forwarding uh, to an external domain. You can still auto forward to another mailbox within your tenants. And of course, you can still manually forward individual emails. That's fine. This just blocks a user from, from forwarding all messages to an external domain. All right, next thing we like to look at here is block user consent to apps. Um, in a lot of the kind of defender sales material, Microsoft likes to talk about shadow IT and how terrible that is that you know, users can add their own things into your IT environment. You should monitor that. But then at the same time, Microsoft makes it pretty easy by default for users to turn on some kind of shadow IT things uh, within your Office 365 tenant if those apps are in the Azure store. I certainly recommend um, that administrators go through and prevent users from adding applications from the Azure store into your Office 365 tenant, either Teams, SharePoint, places like that, where these apps can be added into your system. Uh, some of those apps are kind of dangerous. Uh, you know, now Microsoft doesn't necessarily vet all of them and ensure that they aren't uh, problems. And then some of them even that, that are perfectly legit apps and, and people may have legitimate uses for in some situations, there may be other reasons that your organization doesn't want your data taken out of Office 365 or put into these other apps, uh, security or compliance reasons for that. So I certainly recommend Everybody go into their Azure Active Directory, find the enterprise applications, user settings, and prevent users from adding these applications into Teams and SharePoint. Um, really, I think that's something that should be done by administrators. When I come across customers that uh, have left this on, it's pretty common that we'll see, you know, I'll talk to the administrators and they'll, they'll well, I had no idea why that's turned on there. Really, we want to control that, make sure that the organization understands where your data is going to, what applications are added into your Office 365. If you allow users to turn on these applications by default, pretty much somebody's going to go into Teams and add some crazy apps in there, and you don't really know where your data is going unless you're monitoring that and managing it. So always recommend block your users from adding those apps. I saw a question uh, in the last session about user consent or admin consent. I believe this is what they were referring to. This is uh, how you block user consent. Also, there is admin consent you can set up there uh, in the same area too. Here we are a little bit this is still the consent and permissions. You can see these are the user consent settings. There are admin consent settings, uh, pretty much the same set of settings there so that you can control individually whether users or administrators can add applications into your tenant. It's all there under enterprise applications in your Azure Active Directory portal. All right, moving on. Block user access to the Azure portal. Uh, this is something that, that I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not super sold on. Some organizations like to do this, some don't. Um, by default, if you're just a standard user, you can go to portal.azure.com and you can see information about your Office 365 tenant there. Uh, with just standard user account, don't have any admin rights, uh, everything will be grayed out. You won't be able to change anything in that portal. You see many of the screenshots that are taken here. I took with an account that didn't have admin access turned on. So a lot of the settings are grayed out and that's fine. But some organizations don't want the users to be able to go in there, you know, and kind of look at the settings for Azure portal. If that's the case, then you can uh, block access to the Azure portal right there. Azure Active Directory user settings, restrict access to the admin portal, keep the users out of the admin portal. Again, doesn't affect anybody's rights to anything uh, except the ability to see the Azure portal. Next thing I recommend, guest access. So guest access is um, kind of a big complicated subject within Office 365, Microsoft 365. Um, so 
I'm not going to go into all the different places that guest access can be controlled, how that works everywhere. But I will say that by default, guests can invite other guests. And that kind of gets into a bit of a, a bit of a hairy mess for me. So I always recommend that administrators uh, prevent guests from inviting guests at the very least. Um, if you are going to turn on guest access in your tenant, good idea to ensure that those guests don't have the right to invite other guests. You want to control that a little better. So here under the Azure Active Directory, you can see you can control the ability for guests to invite other guests. Recommend turning that off, um, but be careful with the guest access. There is a lot to that. Uh, I have had uh, a couple customers, you know, they've started messing with the guest access uh, because the controls are kind of spread out over SharePoint and Teams and Azure Active Directory. It can turn into kind of a complex warren of different uh, settings when you're doing that guest access. Recommend go slow with guest access. Be careful. Ensure you know what's going on. Do a lot of auditing and logging to ensure you know what guests are doing, where they're doing it. And there can be a lot to control kind of across the Office 365 suite between Teams and SharePoint when you're managing that guest access. Block anonymous users can join a meeting, Teams meetings by default. Um, if anyone has the link to that Teams meeting, they can uh, by default just join into your meetings. Um, I recommend that you block anonymous users from logging into that so that at least you know you know somebody has to has to say who they are as they log into your into your meetings there are more restrictive um, policies that you can also apply here also within teams uh, there are all, a number of different sessions you can sections where you can see the policy you see meeting policies uh, customization policies a bunch of different policies that you can set uh, within Office 365 in Teams, um, there are different ways to control those. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that unless somebody has a specific question. But those policies across Teams, there's a number of them. It can be kind of complex to control. There are some new ways that Microsoft has added into Teams to kind of simplify that. But those policy packages, kind of a new feature that Microsoft has added to kind of simplify that, does require a higher licensing level. So you can look at policy packages if you'd like to kind of simplify your overall team's policies, uh, but it does require Azure Active Directory P1, I think, uh, or a higher licensing level to use those policy packages. Limit external sharing in SharePoint. Again, um, by default, SharePoint does allow a, a fair amount of external sharing outside of your organization. I recommend as you're using SharePoint, uh, please go into the SharePoint admin portal. There under sharing, uh, Microsoft has set up a relatively straightforward, uh, simple interface here where you can control the sharing policies within SharePoint. Again, this is a very simplified uh, version of that, controlling that external sharing. There, it can be more detailed than this. Um, certainly, there are ways to control sharing at, at different levels within SharePoint. Um, not going to go into all that. I'm not really a SharePoint expert myself, uh, but this at least is at a high level a way that a fairly uninitiated, uninitiated, you know, your Office 365 administrator uh, who may not be super versed in SharePoint uh, can at least have some level of control over those sharing, over that external sharing within SharePoint and OneDrive uh, without being really a, a SharePoint expert. Next thing we have here, password policies. Um, haven't talked a whole lot about passwords. I don't think I'm going to go super deep into passwords other than say that NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, every quarter uh, publishes a, a password, kind of their recommendations for how to secure passwords. Uh, they do a bunch of research. 
Uh, it's a great resource. You can look for NIST password policies. They will, uh, they will, uh, a Google search for that will, will bring up the, the latest recommendations. Recommend everybody read that and understand that. Uh, but there are some things within those recommendations that, that, that I certainly recommend organizations take in, like expiring passwords. Um, not a great idea to force your users to change their passwords every 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, that research shows that tends to force the users to use simpler passwords that are easier to remember uh, or write those passwords down in insecure ways. Always recommend don't expire passwords. Let users create long, complicated passphrases and then keep those indefinitely. Here within the uh, Office 365 uh, admin portal, this is just portal.office.com in the admin section, you can, there's a simple checkbox here so that passwords don't expire within Azure Active Directory. Uh, this is, again, regardless of what your policies are on-premises, in your on-premises Active Directory, if you're using DuraSync and syncing those passwords up, uh, checking this box will only ensure that the Password doesn't expire in Azure Active Directory, but obviously if the password is changed on-premises due to an on-premises password policy, that will of course be synced up uh, into Azure Active Directory. And you know your users could still have expiring passwords even if you check this box is really what I'm saying, uh, based on where that password is mastered. If it's mastered on-premises, you have a password policy that forces users to change passwords after a certain amount of time. Those will still be synced up uh, you know, the user will have to change the password on premises and it'll still be synced up as a change. It doesn't affect that, uh, but we do recommend that you don't force your users to change their passwords on any sort of regular schedule. Uh, we are coming up in the end of time here. Uh, so I just want to go through some more stuff quick. Again, if there are any questions anybody has, please feel free to put them into the portal and we'll address them shortly here. Talk for about five or six more minutes, and then we'll uh, look through the questions. Self-service password reset. Um, always a great idea here to turn on self-service password reset. Resetting users' passwords is a pain. Nobody wants their help desk to do that. Self-service password reset within Office 365 um, allows users to reset their own passwords, does require MFA, has to be set up previously. And there is a licensing level that's required, Azure Active Directory P1, I believe, to write those passwords back into your on-premises Active Directory. So if users don't, if your organization doesn't have a self-service password reset um, sort of solution on-premises, uh, you can use this within Azure Active Directory to allow users to change their own or reset their own passwords, get back into their accounts there. And then with that P1 license, those passwords can be written back to on-premises so that you have kind of that self-service password reset functionality on-premises as well. Great tool to use, highly recommend it, saves all kinds of trouble. All right, password reset notifications. Um, you can turn on within uh, the Azure Active Directory reset notifications. You can notify administrators when other administrators reset the password, that sort of thing. Good idea to keep track of. Handy, handy feature. Not gonna to talk too much about it unless anybody has any questions there. Good idea. Keep your administrators up to date, what's going on, who's changing passwords, then your tenants. Uh, identity governance, kind of running out of time, not gonna go into this too much more, but there are some new really cool identity governance features within Azure Active Directory, uh, lifecycle management, there are templates in there. So you can um, automatically have lifecycle management added into your accounts within Office 365. There are things, uh, flows in there, if you look at them, that will you know, do some, some account management for you, uh, remove old accounts, ensure that accounts expire after a specific amount of time, kind of help with the onboarding and offboarding process of users into your tenant. Highly recommend everybody look at this. 
Uh, the life cycle management is currently in public preview, so it should be available to everyone. I would expect that there will be licensing requirements uh, for that feature once it goes to general availability. Let's see, a couple more minutes here before I go to questions, and then we'll take a quick break before the final session. This uh, screenshot here shows the identity governance life cycle management uh, workflows that are in my tenant by default. You can see onboarding, pre-hiring employees, post-offboarding employees. There are a bunch of different workflows or you know, five or six of them in here by default templates that you can use. And of course, you can create your own workflows. You can modify these or create your own that will send notifications, inactivate accounts, uh, deactivate accounts, that sort of thing uh, as users come into and leave your organization. No All right, corporate branding um, on the logo page. Again, always recommend organizations just look at the branding, put some put some things up there so that users know that they're logging into your tenant. Um, while you know, I don't think it's, from a security perspective, the aesthetics of it isn't super important to me. It is a great idea to put kind of at least some branding in there so that users know they're authenticating to the proper tenant. Uh, helps helps users know they're in the right spot, make sure everything is going the way it's, uh, it should instead of users logging into wrong tenants. Um, more of an issue kind of in mergers and acquisitions when users may have multiple tenants, uh, situations like that, but a little bit of branding, help your users know where they're logging in, make sure that uh, they're logging into the right tenant. Always handy. Let's see, SPF DKIM DMARC, Again, not going to go into this for a, a whole bunch because we're kind of running out of time. If anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to bring them up. But these are three different technologies that are pretty easy to set up within Office 365. They can provide a good amount of security for your email. It can ensure – these are all really to ensure other organizations uh, that the email coming from your organization is valid and is not spam. Uh, so you would turn these on in your tenant so that everybody else knows that email coming from your tenant isn't spam, is authentically from you. And then kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about, not going to go into too much here, is a secure score tool. If you go into uh, security.microsoft.com, up there at the top, about four or five items down, you'll see the secure score. It is a lovely tool within Office 365 that evaluates hundreds of settings across your Office 365 tenant and can give you recommendations for how to improve the overall security of your Office 365 tenant. The recommendations that are made within Secure Score do vary based on your licensing level. So if you you know, buy E5 licenses and turn on some of those Defender products, there, you will see more items will pop up in here, uh, more things that you can control, and your secure score will go down uh, as you apply those licenses because you'll have new controls available to you. Always recommend organizations look at the secure score. Uh, spend some time going through those recommendations and ensure that you're you're keeping your tenant as secure as possible. Microsoft updates these secure score recommendations regularly. So I recommend that it should be something that, you know, should have an administrator look through these fairly quickly or, or on a regular basis and kind of understand the settings that you have there. All right, we are about out of time, so I wanted to save a few minutes here to address any questions from the audience before we hand you over to our third session. Chris, do we have any questions? We have a ton of questions. Uh, our audience is, are, is awake today. Uh, let's jump right in and see how many we can get done. Uh, first question, is it possible to sync Mac OS local user passwords to Microsoft 365 passwords? Uh, Mac OS user passwords. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, of course, uh, Mac OS, I believe, can log into Active Directory. Um, so, of course, you can have a user on a Mac using an Active Directory account, but no, I don't know of any way to sync local Mac OS user passwords into Azure Active Directory, no. OK, 
Hey, uh, Sandra has a couple of good questions. Uh, first one is, is there a way to block uh, MFA from being set up from phone numbers that are outside the U.S.? Ah, um, excellent question. And the answer would be, as far as I know, the only thing to do with that is just to block phone numbers or, you know, block users from getting SMS or phone calls as an MFA uh, option. I don't know of any way that you could only allow users to use specific formats um, of phone numbers for that MFA. Would be an interesting um, thing to look at, some normalization rules. I know, you know, within teams, uh, you can set up normalization rules to kind of control phone numbers and, and ensure that sure that phone numbers are set up right. I don't know of any way to do that for, for MFA, though, so I don't think so. Okay, her second question is, how do we know if we should approve admin consent requests? Some of the apps we've never even heard of. Yeah, that's that's always, um, always a difficult uh, problem, and I think the short answer is default to no. I just don't approve those 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 requests unless it is an app that you have heard of, you know what it's doing with your data, where your data is being stored, that your data isn't, you know, being leaked or putting you in a compliance issue with those apps. So I guess the best answer I can give you is default to no, unless it's an application that you have done your research, you thoroughly understand, and you're comfortable with your organization's data going to that application and allowing that application to do whatever it is they do with it. That's sound advice. All right, next question. How can users sign in with shared mailbox? They don't have any password, so what password will they use to log in? Um, it's possible to, to set the password, to know the password on those accounts and log in. Uh, I, I would agree that, that in most circumstances, most users aren't gonna figure out what the password is for that, and it's, it's pretty unlikely. Uh, but again, that just means that, that the only people that are gonna be able to get into them are the bad guys. So, you know, again, I recommend prevent, uh, prevent users from, from logging in directly to those shared mailbox resources, uh, just, just blocking that authentication. But I do agree, it's, it's unlikely that a standard user, you know, Sally in accounting probably isn't gonna figure out how to log into those shared mailboxes. So that pretty much just leaves the bad guys with that option. Okay, Mark wants to know, conditional access can block access when a user tries to access Microsoft 365 services from a high-risk country, but is there a way to also block the same user with that same device around the same time if they connect via VPN connection that routes via a non-high-risk country, which then enables them to access Microsoft 365 services? We might need to draw a diagram for this one, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand the question. Um, and, and the short answer is not really. So you can definitely use um, the, the conditional access feature within Office 365 to ensure that users are only authenticating from either countries or it's really only by IP address. Um, it, it does the country because ICANN, the, the organization that, that assigns IP addresses knows who has each IP address. They keep information for where those IP addresses are. So uh, CAE doesn't really evaluate by country, it evaluates by IP address, and then specific IP addresses may be assigned into specific countries so that the system would know that somebody's trying to log in from, you know, Russia or wherever that way. So the answer is not really. If somebody uses a VPN, then their IP address coming out of their machine into Azure Active Directory is going to appear as it is in that VPN. That's you know why you see all those uh, mm -hmm. commercials for VPN services that are like, you can access Germany Netflix from America using this. That works the same way for everybody. So no, there really isn't a good way to block that. Okay, let's try to squeeze in two or three more questions here. Uh, how would you secure admin accounts you use with PowerShell? How would I secure admin accounts I use with PowerShell? Um, well, I, 
I, I wouldn't specifically say that, that it's important to secure admin accounts you use with PowerShell. It's just important to secure admin accounts in general for whatever the purpose they are. A um, couple things I recommend, uh, you know, auditing your accounts, kind of the things that we've talked about here. Make sure your admins have multi-factor authentication turned on. Audit your accounts. Um, watch what they're signing into, that sort of thing. And privileged identity management is also a great feature, uh, which, you know, I have my account that I use every day uh, in my Office 365 tenant. Uh, I use privileged identity management. So most of the time that's just a standard user account, but I can use privileged identity management to grant myself admin privileges uh, only for a set period of time. So that's always a great idea. Um, you know, for instead of using two separate accounts, a, a regular account that you use to to do your email and all your day-to-day -day work and a separate admin account, privileged identity management is a great way to just use that single account and make sure that it doesn't have admin rights all the time when they're not needed. Okay, last question. How do I keep up with changes in Microsoft 365? <laughs> yeah, that's always... Um, Always a big, big question, and there's no easy way to do it. Um, you're here listening to this webcast. Of course, I think that's always a, a great idea to uh, listen to, to webcasts like this. Keep up with us here. We'll give you good information. But additional to that, you know, get to know Office 365 MVPs. There's a bunch of people that are Office 365 MVPs. They have their own websites or, or different ways that they share information, um, follow, follow MVPs that, that have good information and, and work for you. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of books. Uh, Tony Redman has a, has a great office 365 book that's regularly updated. You can subscribe to that book. It's not just a one-time purchase kind of thing, regularly updated. That's great information, lots of blogs. And of course, within the admin portal in office 365, while it's not incredibly user-friendly. There are always notifications that go into there of all the features and functionality that are changing within Office 365. You can take some time uh, and review those. While that's not always incredibly user-friendly, it's good information. Okay, that's all the time we have. Thanks for the great talk, Nathan. Thank you very much. Have a good day.